Now the first episode of our classic serial, Gargantua and Pantagruel, by Rabelais. A cartoonish, exuberant romp concerning the excesses of medieval giants, and like the adjectives the author gave his name to, it contains earthy language and bawdy humour. Bon santé! To life, to carnival, to abundance. Here's a toast to you, my lusty listeners. Gargantua and Pantagruel by Francois Rabelais. Dramatised by Lavinia Murray. Episode 1. Life is not for the easily offended, and neither are my stories. So quaff, laugh, and cuddle up close, because I'm going to tell you about giants. Why? Because they're excessive. Almost as soon as the whirly began, Cain murdocked his brooder, Abel. The erda was fertilized by the blore of the intersect, the cronked calcium of the jostled. Every throng flourished. There was a humper harvest, especially of meddlers. Oh, that is sufficient for biliousness, Francois, I hear you say, kindly reverb to the common denominator. And did I say meddler, as in open arse fruits? I did. Meddlers nourished by the blood of the murdered cause engorgement. But what swells varies from person to person. Everybody ate the meddlers and swelled. Some gained giant shoulders. Some men gained giant members, passing it 17 times about their waists. Oh, they grew marvellous, long, fat, lusty, crested, spooming in full sail. You would have mistaken these champions for knights with their lances settled on their rest, ready to run at the ring or tilt. Others grew enormously in ballocks. Three of them would fill a sack. Others grew in the legs, and you would have thought they were herons or ostriches or men on stilts. In others, their noses grew. Others grew ears so big you could have made a tailored suit out of them with matching raincoat, waterproofed by natural waxes. Others grew in length of body, and out of these came the giants. My story begins with a giantess called Queen Gargamel, wife to King Grangousier. Grand Gousier and Gargamel are entertaining friends in the castle's fine willow grove whilst they await the birth of their first child. Oh, oh, felt a pang then. Waters haven't broken yet, but that was definitely a contraction. Oh, where's that great lunk wandered off to? Grand Gousier! Grand Gousier! Oh, I'll have a little nibble at this tripe. Mmm! Mmm! Oh, you know what? I'll have a little bit more. Hmm. I shall be a father soon. You have the easy part, my love. Uh, drink what you want, friends. Uh, and this vast mound of tripe needs eating. You've gone off by tomorrow. Oh, delicious gone with you, my love. Where's it from? Vichy. Le Pays des Vaches. Hmm. It's the best tripe I've ever tasted. Don't eat too much sweetness. It'd make you cack. <laughs> well, I'll do that anyway, dear. Well, there are degrees of cacking, my dear. You don't want tripe belly, not when you're a ripe belly. No. Ah, ah, ah. <laughs> Let us submerge ourselves in the wonderful comfort of Gargamel's womb. Careful, ease yourselves alongside this wonderful unborn child, this marvellous 11-month-old fetus, the hero of my first tale. Oh, here he is, inverted and ready to squeeze himself into the world. But wait a minute, the nitpickers among you are saying Gargamel is 11 months pregnant. 11 months? Just how many pregnant women have you known, Monsieur Rabelais? I'm a doctor. I've dissected a fair few. Eleven months is an indication of the care nature has lavished on the creation of this child. Mm. Oh, he's waking up. Shh, hide. Hello? Can anyone hear me? What the heck's this? It looks like a length of rope. Clever boy, he's found his umbilicus. Is it attached to something? Oh, oh, me! 
it's attached to me. <laughs> and on the other end of the rope, there's a beret. Oh, I've grown my own beret. Clever boy, he's found his placenta. Listener, you will never wear a beret without acknowledging your time in the womb with your placenta on your head. Oh, drink. Drink? Good idea. Yes, he's drinking the amniotic fluid. Have a little sip if you like. Oh, oh it's a bit booyabasy. It is. Oh, oh, whoa, whoa, whoa. Where's the floor gone? What's this gaping hole? If I were you, I'd stick my head down and see where it goes. You would? Definitely. But it leads to out there, doesn't it? Yes. Oh, I'm not sure. I mean, I like being, I like being here. I don't know what's out there. I'm a bit, you know, it's scary. You need have no fear. It's wonderful out there. And I'm making a rather nice story for you. Oh, well, in that case... Oh, great, thanks. Stuck. I'll grab your legs. Pull you back up. Oh, oh, was that a trick? No, don't stop trying to get out. Your birth is going to be rather special. Oh, it's hot. I'm moving into the shade. <laughs> Look who's making a fool of himself again, wobbly thing. Talking of wobble... I'll take a bit of tripe with me for sustenance. Or food. Or swill. Somebody watch the wife. Make sure she's not stuffing herself with tripe. Or she'll get the khaki cat cacks. You mind your own business. I'll eat what I like. Thank you very much. And it's your fault I'm like this, you great lunk. Oh, oh, now I need a wee. Still parched. Hello. What's this? Our impetuous unborn hero has found his mother's bladder filled to overflowing with a little watered wine. More drink! Chardonnay? I'll try my luck down this hole again. It seems to have widened. Well, that's odd. I really needed a wee, but now I don't. What's that, my love? Look, bit of a mystery. My waters haven't broken, but my belly's deflated quite a bit. And my wee has vanished. It's a hot day, my love. You've probably sweated it away like dew. <laughs> oh! Ah! Uh, I think... Uh, I think that was a contraction. Nature's had 11 months to create a masterpiece. Yes, but it's not going to be easy squeezing it out. Ooh! Ah! Oh, my belly! Shall I rub it, my love? Ouch! Ouchie! Ouchie! Ouch! No! Courage, my darling. Worry no more. <laughs> ah, I'm off for another drink. But midwives are hidden all over the willow grove, ready to answer your cries when the time comes. But I can't see any. You will when you need them. Men. <laughs> oh! Ooh! Ah! <laughs> Help! It feels like I've got the Inquisition up my bum. <laughs> Midwife. Ah, no, no, that's not a baby, that's your rectum. I'll just stuff it back in. You been at the tripe? Oh, sorry, yes. Ah, well, pregnant cravings, eh? We all get him. I ate my husband's shoes. <laughs> you need your sphincters constricting until the effects of the tripe wear off. Oh, I get stitching. Oh, oh, oh. There, nothing will get out of there. Nothing for it. I have to go back. Hoist myself up. Yeah, I'll just keep climbing. Ah. Oh, this is a slippy, sloppy, spongy sort of devil. He finds footholds in her spleen. Whoops, oh, over this great slab of flabber. Pours himself across the great plane of her liver. Ah, past the great puff and flat. 
Captain Flutsack squirms past her lungs using her ribcage as a ladder, gaining a foothold on her heart and gripping Gargamel's collarbones for leverage, up he comes, seeking an entrance into the world. For a moment, he stares out from behind his mother's eyes. Light. I can see light. Now he pushes up into her throat along the food pipe. Then he turns, spots a promising tunnel, and heaves himself out through his mother's left ear. Merciful Marsh Gas. The child's out, and it's an odd shape and an unusual shade, but <laughs> I love it. That's a whopping wadge of earwax. Here's the baby. <laughs> Best give it a bit of a buff. <laughs> Boy or girl? It's a boy. <laughs> some drink, some drink, some drink. Did you hear that? We did. More drink, more drink, more drink. Why, bless him, he has his father's thirst. Children emerging from their mothers through unorthodox halls are all wondrous, all champions. <laughs> Look at the size of him. Your dugs are in perfect proportion to the task in hand. No, they're not. I'll need help. Name what you need and I'll get it, my love. Well, taking the current rate of flow per dug as an average, that would mean I've 3,972 cargs per hour. So, uh, uh, just let me do the maths here. Um, say for carry one over. Uh, I'll need approximately 17,913 cows. I'll just, uh, just reach over the hills and pick them. Oh, oh. Love, you're such a handy husband, such a practical dad. I am a dad, aren't I? <laughs> well done, good Sir Whopper. Now, let's get him baptized and then let's we'll celebrate the baptism with more drink, more drink, more drink. But what are we going to call him? We could use the first part of your name, uh, Gaga. Well, we could call him Gaga. I know. What about Lord Gaga? Three more years pass sweetly enough. Gargantua grows in stature and girth, and his days are filled with food, mess, play, sleep, and mess. Don't forget the mud and the snot and the other muck. Gargantua wallowed in mud. His nose was always snotty, his face mottled with muck. He trod down his shoes at the heel and his toes burst out of them at the front. He ran after butterflies and pissed his legs, wiped his nose on his sleeve, shat in his shirt, drunk out of his shoe, slobbered everywhere, washed his hands in his soup, sharpened his teeth on his toys and combed his head with tree roots. He spat and farted and used everything contrary. Grand Gozier, what are you doing? Eating an apple, of course. <laughs> oh, look at the state of him. What do you mean? Blindfold me, put him in a sty, and I won't be able to tell him apart from a pig. <laughs> I was the same as him at that age. You're the same as him now, after a few too many. Don't be too harsh on the lad, eh, Mother? Oh, but look at the state of him. Daddy, Mummy! Today, I have learnt the best way to wipe my bum. Oh, see, Mum? I experimented with cassocks, hassocks, cossacks, fossicks, bullocks, mollusks, uh, fossils, espadrilles, cheap thrills, mattresses and buttresses. Next, I used your best cloth gloves, Mother. These ones, Gargantua? Yes. You can see the print of my bolt hole. Oh, yes. You can. It's very clear. Then I went into the garden and used herbs. Knotweed, ragwort, sagwort, soapwort and radishes. Then I lowered the apple tree boughs and used the apples before letting them bounce back. None fell off despite the weight of khaki on them. These apples? Yes, father. Keep eating. Don't upset the boy. Then cakes and bread, hog wattles, almonds, ballybully biscuits, sweetbreads, wattles, scuttles and... Oh, yes, yes, but which wipe wiped the best? He wants you to know the full extent of his experiment. I tried hay, 
straw, beeswax, ants' nests, parchment. I went through the whole library and tried each book. Some shut, some open, and others with their pages flapping. <laughs> and some left illustrations and others definitions, explanations, poems, and flash fiction on my tuck. And what was the best bum wipe? A living goose's neck. All the fluffy feathers held between the legs, up against your knock hole, the heat spreading up to the belly and over the heart and up to the brains. The warm, soft neck of a living goose held between your legs is heaven on earth, in my opinion. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Send him to the sorbum. I know my son's mind is keener than most by his fathoming of arse wipes. I know he's, he's civilised. I'm going to have him taught by the most outstanding philosopher of the day, Monsieur Tubal Holofenes. Monsieur Toodle Toodle who? Oh, but first, he needs new clothes. He, he can't sit in a classroom in this state. So, dressed beautifully but ridiculously in damask and jewels, Gargantua goes to meet his tutor. Now, reputations are often the jumbled residue left by Chinese whispers. This is particularly true of Monsieur Tubal Holofenes. In fact, it looks as though guesswork dressed him and accident created him. He's thin. He's ramrod thin. He's wizened, with hair like the hackles of a vexed boar and a beard like pine needles shed on pocked cheese. His nostril hairs are waxed to resemble a swallow in flight. Gargantua is mesmerized by the volume of oddity that has come to rest in a man. I am Monsieur Tubal Holofenes, boy, and I am the best there is. I am the acme, epitome, and morrissey of the past. I am an epidemic of learning, and I will set you up for a life of debility and yawning. Now sit down. Not there, here. Yes, sir. Gargantua, do you know your alphabet? Uh, yes. It fills your mouth and you spit it out, that's speech. It spooned into your ears, that's hearing. It spread over your brain, that's understanding. Why can't I taste it when I speak? You've mudded your palate with mud. Writing is like the stains left on the table in your clothes following a meal. Only these stains are left on parchment. Now watch me. I'm a magus, a sorcerer, and when I sneeze, you can swat the word, swat the word, using a fly swat. Now watch, watch, I'm going to give you a big word, let me tickle my nose first. Revelation, 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 revelation. Got it, you see? Ooh. Now look at its shape, those are its letters, letters of the alphabet. But now we can see it for what it is. We can study it. Stare. Stare, stare. Can I have a go? Yes, let's see how well you can manage. Oh, let me tickle my nose first. <laughs> restraint! Restraint! <laughs> restraint! <laughs> restraint! <laughs> restraint! <laughs> oh, it's strenuous, isn't it, boy? Yes. <laughs> well, don't let restraint evade you. <laughs> oh, 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 dear. <laughs> Restraint has eluded you. Oh, poo. Well, I'll let it out so it'll hang around the sconce and breed. Off we go. <laughs> now, I'm here to make a prince of you. A studious prince, a student prince. I'll teach you what you should be and what you should know to be what you should be. And should you eventually be it, and with God's grace you will be, you will be prepared for it. I will? For what? Ah! For that. Yes! Yes, you have my word. The word of Tubal. <laughs> Gargantua remains a merry dunderhead, and Holofenes is still an ineffectual intellectual with the teaching skills of a bedbug. Gargantua looks the same, perhaps a little taller, but five gigantic meals a day means that Monsieur Holofenes' belly bag has developed a distinct convexity. This morning, though, this amiable status quo is about to be interrupted. Grangousier has learned through court tittle-tattle that his son may not be the cleverest and best educated child in Christendom. He has competition. Grangousier has come to put Gargantua's education to the test. Ah, Professor Holofenes. 
<laughs> Excuse me for interrupting. You are welcome to my classroom, sire. Uh, thank you. Uh, there are some people I'd like you to meet. There are. I would like to introduce you to Eudemon. Hello, Monsieur Holofnes. Hello, Prince Gargantua. Hello, Lemon. It's Eudemon, not Lemon, Gargantua. <laughs> Sorry, Dad. And who's this with him? He's dressed like me. This is Eudemon's tutor. The respected Panocrates. Oh, the respected Panocrates, is it? How old is Eudemon, Monsieur Panocrates? He's gargantuous age and has been tortured in all the necessary moods and shades of modern education by my good self. I have, Your Majesty. Well, let's see how much both these uh, clever young boys know. Hmm? I, I'd like to compare and contrast. <laughs> Although I have to say, I have every faith in my own hand-picked pedagogue. Hand-picked pedagogue? Who's that, then? You. Ooh, cacking roosters. Hello, gentlemen. Queen oh, God. God. I'd like to watch these fine young scholars, too. Yes. Yes, it, it will be marvellous to see these two clever and exquisitely educated lads answering questions, showing off their knowledge. A friendly roustabout of intellectual acumen. And so it began. Eudemon was asked what he knew. And four hours later... Finally, most people can calculate the square on the hypotenuse, but I can calculate the circle on the hypotenuse, and using my calculations, reconfigure the Archimedes screw. <sighs> very, very well said, Eudemon. Thank you, Eudemon has been assessed by the austere company of stationers and awarded their top trophy, the Golden Ream. Does that actually mean anything, Poncho, my friend? It means he's damn good. Now for my son, Gargantua. Yes, father? What have you learned that will please your father? <clears throat> Animal impersonations. Ah, <laughs> Bet you Dodo can't do that. Uh, I must explain. Yes, sir. I think you must. We are following a very new educational plan, King Grangusi, Queen Gargamel. Gargantua has learned animal impersonation, since we learn by mimicry. And what better place to start than among the beasts and birds perfected by nature herself? <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> I'm gobsmacked. Yes, yes. But now, King Grangousier, Queen Gargamel, this will secure his reputation as a scholar. Gargantua, your pièce de résistance, s'il vous plaît. <laughs> what was that? That is a trump from a dead donkey. It is, is it? It constitutes the finest educational syllabus. I, I sent off for it, especially. Species awareness. I think I may just kill you, Master Holofernes. Kill me? Why? What have I done? You have made my beloved son look a fool. <laughs> you certainly did. Where is he gone? He's disappeared. Oh, no. Oh, I, I, I'm going to have to sit down. <laughs> Oh. Oh, dear. Have I, uh... You've sat on poor Monsieur Holofernes. Dad swatted him with his bum, Mum. Yes, Your Majesty, you have. Oh, can I see? No, you little ghoul, you can't. Oh, dear. Oh, dear. I, I, I didn't really mean to kill the poor bastard. It's all right, Grand Gouzier. You didn't. I did. I placed him on your chair knowing he would be flattened. I'd had enough of him. I'll just roll him up like a piece of parchment, tuck him under my arm and take him with me. Oh, but before I go, can I suggest you hire Panocrates as Gargantua's tutor and that you pack them off to Paris to complete his, um, <clears throat> education? All right. All right, Panocrates, you heard Monsieur Rabelais. You're hired. What about me, Monsieur Panocrates? Sometimes sacrifices have to be made. You're it. But... This is a better gig, clear off. 
Your Majesty, uh, we'll need one very, very, very large horse. And a little one for me. Ah, Paris. It's the omphalos of the civilized world. It's the belly button of education, the navel of knowledge. Uh, but I should warn you, Gargantua, Parisians, despite their erudition and sophistication, crave novelty. Look at the size of that horse. Well, never mind that. Look at that gigantic lad sat on that huge horse. Let me see. Let me see. Oh, just look up. Whoa. Oh, dear. Now we are the center of attention. I'm going to dismount uh, and sit on this cathedral. It's Notre Dame, lad, and mine Saint Chapelle. Where? By your left foot. Yes, that's it. Oh, good job you said I'd have put my foot through it. As I said, I'm going to rest my buttocks on Notre Dame uh, and say hello. Hello! Hello! Well, at least he's not the pillaging sort. Yeah, but he's only gone and set on Notre Dame. That's sacrilege. Don't be daft. Birds land on it, masons climb up it, monks and nuns race each other across the roof. Only when you're off your face. Ooh, he's a proper whopper. Where's he come from? Anyone know? Where are you from? Shout louder, he's not heard you. Where are you from? Well, he's not local, is he? Show them civility, Gargantua. You are a prince. Show deference, interest, chivalry, benevolence, reserve, kindness, and playfulness. But I need a wee. I'm going to have to wee. Oh, dear. Well, aim for the sin. I will. Tell them it's wine. Then they won't take offense. They'll think you're generous, not uh, decanting your bladder. Would you like some wine, my friends? Oh, he's got wine. Where's the bottle? Maybe it's a cask. Here it is. Oh. oh. It's not a bottle or a cask. That's his... Don't ask. And like most boys, his aim is off. And Gargantua's deluge begins to flood Paris. Ring the bell. This is an emergency. Slash flood. Urine torrent. Time to launch. Ring the bells. Ring the bells. Whoops. No need. These piss ringing the bells. Gargantua, look what you've done. Half Paris will be washed away unless you divert the flow. Oh, the bells are piss drip ringing. But I aimed for the river, I really did. I know, Gargantua, we've all fallen wide of the mark. They shouldn't have built everything so close together. It's a city, that's what cities are. Puddles, heaps, clutters. But you've got to do something. Half the citizens are drowning. I'll bail out the streets. But what with? Oh, those bells are very loud. They're very big bells, aren't they? Scoop, bail, huge bells. Ha-ha! <laughs> I'll use the big bells. Brilliant. Perfect. Give me strength. He corrects one outrage by committing another. Where shall I tip it? Throw it clear of the city. <laughs> ah, yellow Whoops, not quite far enough. Uh, je suis désolé. Uh, try again. <sighs> Much better, Gargantua. That will have fallen comparatively harmlessly on the outlying fields. I hope. Do you know, uh, I'm enjoying myself. I like Paris. Keep bailing, lad. Uh, Keep bailing. Oh, I think I'm going to fit in here quite nicely. Oh, the delusions of youth. Meanwhile, on the piss-flooded streets of Paris... Uh, uh, I've swallowed some! Quick, skewer apples together on these old lances. Uh, Tie rows of apples lances together need a life raft. Apples! What about of apples? Onions. Try onions. Try onions. <laughs> Nearly done! <laughs> Nearly done, almost there! Oh, not onions! Try pears! Pears, everyone! Hey, I rather like these bells. You know what? I'm going to hang them round my mare's neck and then I'll send her back home loaded with souvenirs of Paris. Brie, fresh herrings, uh, a moulin or two. The Parisians won't like you taking their bells, Gargantua. Why? They believe their bells keep out hurricanes and devils and bring chocolate from the Pope at Easter. 
The bells bring chocolate. Just put them back, lad. It's stealing. I'm hanging them around my mare's neck. Yeah. Mark my words, Gargantua. There will be repercussions. In the town hall, the enraged citizens plot their revenge. It's an insult! It's an insult! Any old giant rides into the city, barks his bum on the cathedral, he micturates like a cow, and starts looking the bells and pocketing them. Because it's theft. It is. It's that he's a pickpocket. The belfries can be considered a type of pocket or purse, and the bells are the, the loose chains we rattle when we walk past beggars. Now, also, them bells. They are consecrated yeah, bells. Yeah, church right. property they are. The, the church history. Church music. Church mascots. Do churches have mascots? <laughs> Do we have to make a stand? Yeah, well, off you go then. Tell us how you get on. Hello? Monsieur? Oh, who cut your hair? Us? I did. It's flat. Let me give it a little tussle. What? Oh, ow! That's taken ten years off your face. No, just, just give us the bells back. Why? Well, they, they keep the hurricanes away and draw the angels near by keeping the devils at bay. Uh, and they fetch chocolate from the poor Batista. Excuse me. I couldn't help but over here. Not, Pardon? Not now the be- Excuse me. I couldn't help but over here. No, it's no good. I can't hear you. I tell you what, I'll pick you up. And set you down on this gargoyle. Excuse me. I couldn't help but overhear. Not now the bells have gone and it's quiet. Yes? Yes? I'm delighted they've gone. If you have to replace them, put up bells made of cloth with a stuffed glove for a clapper. I mean... In the past. Bing bong bang kong. How could a man think? Hey, that, that's heresy, that <laughs> is. It's no such thing. Bing! It's looking for merciful quiet, but <laughs> bong! Every quarter hour. Bong! They're ringing out. Then there's the bell practices, and they keep on bing! Because they are perfectionists. Bong! And the time between each tolling is filled bing! With practicing, and the mind melts. But dong! Before I write it down, all my written words have shifted through alliteration to onomatopoeia. This man is a human bell. <laughs> Stand him in your belfries. Share him. Swap him around. He's as good. He's probably better. Get him to train up an apprentice. <laughs> we'll make it a new Parisian trade. Leave me out of your bing dong ding bong plans, will you? I'll choose what I ring dingle ding want to bong. Just because you're a tinkle clang giant. I'm putting you in this belfry, Mr. Bell Imitator, and you can start work. <laughs> Uh, ding dong! I don't want to bing! I don't want to bong! You'll get used to it! <laughs> so good morning, Gargantua. Let us hope that our second day in Paris is a little quieter than our first. Now you have finished breakfast, I propose that we start straight away with your lessons. Nothing too taxing, not just yet. So, what am I to study first, Ponocrates? Games. Play seems to be your natural element. I shall teach you through games. This is Climb the Ladder. Billy Batterbum. The Cornish Cough. Joanne Thompson. The Hardest Ass Percy. Mustard Peel. At Fell Down and Todd's Body? At Trill, Madam, or Grapple My Lady? Twirly Whirly Trill? At Rub and Rice? At the Soily Smutchy? At Pinch Without Laughing? At Nivy 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 Neck? Span Counter? At the Peenier? Hand Drop? And the last couple in hell? Right, Gargantua, let's see how good you are at Nivy 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 Neck. Throw the dice. Three. You go first. Go where? I, I don't know how to play Nivy 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 Nack. It's easy. You have the wooden monk as your counter. All right, I'll call him uh, Brother Jean. Move him three paces towards the fire. 
And I'll be this one, St. Peter, swinging on the pearly gates to test the hinges. I throw the dice. Six. The three which you threw goes twice into six, so I can nibby, 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 knack you twice. Eight hours later, it is indeed a long game. Now you can enjoy a few hours of quiet and solitary study. Solitary study? Me on my own? Solo scholarship. It's a chance to exercise self-discipline. Restraint. I never got restraint. <laughs> See you later! Here. That died. Gargantua. Yeah. He's only eating the market. Oh, eating the market? He's eating them. He wrapped the awnings around the stalls, swallowed them. Oh. He ate several market traders. Oh, no, I don't think that were intentional. But we have to act now. Right. Winter's here. Hey? We'll freeze because he smashed our buildings. We'll starve because he's taking our food. However, his coat has got enough clothing to make outfits for every man, woman, and child, as well as some pretty ostentatious off blankets. Oh, really? hey, have you seen the jewels on his cod piece? Uh, See, they, they'd pay for all the damage thousand times over. How are we going to get them off him? Oh, I've, I've got a plan. Well, he may be a giant, but he's as innocent as a newborn babe. He won't have played cards or gamble before. Oh, are we playing for them? We cheat, we win. He gets his comeuppance. <laughs> then we administer the enema. What's the connection? Ah, see, it's an enema full of herbs to induce forgetfulness. Oh. Ah, he's, he'll, he'll forget his misdeeds. He, he'll forget that he likes to play tricks on us. Oh. And I've got it all ready. Including a customised nozzle made from a wine vat and a herd of goats to ram it into place. Oh, goats. We give the giant the enema to cleanse his mind and end his aberrant behaviour. But first, get his clothes. Yeah! yeah. yeah. Ah, Paris. Where shall I go to study? What should I study? Up till now, there's always been a cheap hour in it. Blah, blah, blah. Oi, watch it. You've smashed the chapel of St. Rabina's left buttock. Oops, sorry. It's all right. Look, I'm, I'm putting the bits back. See, here's the uh, little bum cheek. You'll be a lot less of an hazard if you stay put. Why, uh, why don't you come down here? Play cards with us. We, we'd like to get to know you a bit better. Yes, come and play. Oh, uh, thank you. Yes, I, I'd like that. I learn through play. That's it. Sit in the Tweetleries and uh, I'll deal, shall I? La 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 la. Oh, oh my oh, God! Oh, 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 I bet you know, lady. I bet your children's are now. Whatever you do, don't look up. Oh, it's stupendously pendulous. Oh, 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 my Lord, Gargantua, where are your clothes? I, uh, I lost them at cards. Oh, we, we won them from him. Not quite fairly, but we did. We've got our own back on him, the, the great wanton buffoon. Uh, Give me strength, Gargantua. You have disappointed me. More than that, you have let down your father by running round Paris in the buff. Oh, you're not going to tell him, are you? No, 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 no. But I'm going to have to ask your mum to send you more clothes. In the meantime, I shall ask her to borrow some manor warship sails so you at least have a loincloth. And there's something else. Oh? The citizens of Paris are waiting to administer an enema. A what -ima? Ah, using the herbs of correction. Rue, Pemlik, Carfalodi, and hop -ars. I can smell them. That is not so much a punishment as a corrective. It will obliterate the defects in your education. It will, it will appease them somewhat. It will wipe your slate clean. Now, squat, please, Gargantua. <laughs> we'll leave Gargantua for a little while and travel a country road where the cake bakers of King Picricol are about to pass through Grongousier's lands and meet Grongousier's shepherds who have fetched their flock to winter pastures. Hi, cake makers. We'll swap you a flagon of wine for some of your cakes. How about it? No swap, please. You want, you buy, matey. You're not going to miss a few cakes. You've got 16 wagon loads there. We're not a charity, you blutch coodle grattles. Slangums, ninny-hammer doddy, oh. old job and all net slappers and calf -lonies. 
need to change his school of shoes. Flouting, crawl at clubies, belong, snakes, chicken, shepherds. Oh, you're quite a charmer, aren't you? These cakes are for the likes of you, you lot of cheap loaves, old loaves, oh. dry crusts, that's you. These are upper crust, top draw, best echelon Christmas cakes. But we'll pay you for them, we just want a couple of mince pies. Ha, eat my brown out old loaf, knobblehead. Eat my bolly mongrel with millet. Fight, 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 fight. Stop, stop, I've got money. Continue. This is a serious bonfire, and I have a stale madeleine. Help! Help! Help, murder! We are in the presence of King Picricole, an idiot, a very fat, continually cake munching idiot. I'm King Cakey Pig. You can tell an idiot by the company he keeps and the thoughts he dismisses. As I'm listening, cake maker, tell me what wrong has been done to you and by whom. You've lost my sainted cakes because... Quagookio shepherds attacked and robbed us. See this? The sheep's still attached to my rug. <coughs> cake thieves! Oh... I have no alternative but to declare war on Grand Pass me that ghetto. Pass the King's ghetto! Pass the King's ghetto! Pass the King's ghetto! Here you are, mate. Here you are, mate. Here you are, mate. Uh, Your Majesty. Admiral Shadrach, can any of your ships follow the rivers to Grand Gousier's land? Are the rivers deep enough and the ships sufficiently narrow? <coughs> aye, aye, King Picrocole, they can. They are, they do, they will. Captain Swillwin. Yes, King Picrocole. Um, assemble my troops and march them into Grand Gousier's lands. <coughs> Lay waste to his harvest, raise his villages, and fetch any uh, cakes back that you capture as compensation for the loss of our just desserts. Of just our desserts. Yes, King Picricol. Let's Grand Goussier eat brioche. Hi, Let's eat brioche. Hi, brioche. Hi, brioche. Hi, brioche. War creates many heroes, but none as bold, brave, and monkish as the one you're about to witness. King Picricol's men, sailors and soldiers, have invaded a certain monastery vineyard and are met by a certain man of the cloth called Friar Jean. <laughs> Cops, body! Can enemy burn me as freely as a faggot if they take our grapes or taste one drop of our wine? Staff, shaft, or truncheon of the cross! I'm coming at ya! Dearest Gargantua, I am sorry to bring you home, son disrupting your earnest studies, but I need your help. We are being attacked by King Pinklecole's militia, and I don't know why. I will attempt to moderate his anger. I am sending a friendly envoy to discover the cause of his wrath and how he can be recompensed. Love from your dad. Oh, Mum sends her love to kiss, 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 kiss. <laughs> la, 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 la. So, King Grangousier's chosen envoy. That's me in a nutshell. You want to know what this war is about, eh? Well, yes, it would help. Um... Cakes, sir. Cakes. Iced bums, flapjacks, fig rolls, Battenbergs, fondant fancies! Sorry? I've written it all down for you to take back. On a cannonball! Round a cannonball. Dear Lord, Picacola has lost his marbles. Uh, uh, sire. Are you all right? Uh, Did you discover why Picacola's declared war? Uh, uh, King Picacola just kept going on about cakes, sire. He was also eating cakes, sire, non stop. He shot you with a cannonball whilst consuming cakes? The 
cakey pig. <laughs> Power has unsettled his mind. The, the devil has the two halves of his brain in each hand, and when he bangs them together, Picrocol speaks. <laughs> his message is written on <laughs> this cannonball. <laughs> Dear King Grangousier, oh, his next page is illegible. Let me clear the suit. Oh, and intestine. That's it. Oh. Now, uh, cakes, puddings, desserts, and more to the point, my mince pies, my plum puddings, my yule logs, yes, my sacred bush de Noel, are the root cause of this war. Cakes have caused a war? I'm, I'm afraid so, my dear. <laughs> Would you mind putting the cannonball back, sire? My belly feels a bit drafty without it, to be honest, Your Majesty. <laughs> oh. Gargantua and Ponocrates have returned to Grand Gousier's realm. Gargantua is nervous as any young man would be summarily summoned to face an enemy when he has never been called to fight before. Technically, it is a bun fight, but does that make it a just war? A just desserts war, certainly. But one without reason or merit, your father is entirely honorable in his wish to see everything resolved without bloodshed. Stop! 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 Ooh, there's a friar running after us. You go against you, a grand goosey, I said. Yes. Well, you're riding into an ambush. We are. And they know you're coming. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They intercepted the post. Then they put the letter back in the post, so you got it after they read it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Who are you? Well, I'm fighting Friar John from the local monastery. Why? Has Friar John done something wrong? No, no, no I'm not fighting Friar John. I'm fighting Friar John. And <laughs> Picrocol's men are all rascally rogues, plunderers, thieves, and ignorant of military discipline and tactics. I beat them off when they attack my monastery by my holy straight left hook. I plain song their asses and matins them senseless. And now I will fight alongside you, half. I've never fought before. I oh, never heard I up until yesterday. Oh, I'm just a, a wiry, genuflecting, vineyard tended little monk. Oh dear, I'm scared. Gargantua, your father may well lose his kingdom to a violent cake stuffing twit. It is time to behave like the prince you are. It is your duty to protect your parents and your people. I always imagined there would be peace. I thought all the fighting was in the past. But you see the tonsure? The sandals, the rosary. Oh, but uh, voila! The razor knuckles. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The unexpected. <laughs> ooh, ooh, wait a minute, Pinocrates. My man needs a piss. Well, look! Bloody hell, it's a piss that's blood! Oh! She's flushed out the embers. Frajon, I'll hoist you onto my mare. Oh. Giddy up! Yeah! Tactically speaking, the best way to stop an army is to prevent it moving. Now, your mare is so tall, you get a great view, Gargantua. You see? There's Picrocol's army over the next hill to the east. If we three shout halt, they'll stop. Let's give it a go. Halt! We now have a tactical advantage. Can I just point out, there's a lot of them, soldiers. There's a lot of us. Not numerically, but volume-wise. Wait, wait, look at that. Their cannons aren't harnessed to horses. They've attached them to rising dough. Yes, don't you see? As the dough continues to rise, the cannons are dragged forwards and raised. The cannons will get a better shot at your parents' castle. Well, I've heard about this. The bakers create such a strong dough that saints have risen to heaven sitting on the top of a batch loaf. Holy yeast! <laughs> Come on, gentlemen, think. We want to stop this army in the most peaceful manner possible. We have to attack the bread dough. Does it have a natural enemy? The thing that stops bread rising is intense heat. What's the best source of heat? Piss. Hardly. Fire. Fire, correct. What's the best source of fire? Volcanoes! Almost. Hell! The wrong direction. The sun? Yes! I don't see how that's going to solve the problem. I mean, I mean, the sun's shining right now, isn't it? Yes, but think about it. 
You're a giant. Oh, undeniably. You can change height at will. Yes. The thing that stops a rising loaf in its tracks is an oven. The Earth has its own oven. Normally, we're on slow cook, but... Oh! The sun! The sun, that's the answer, isn't it? Fetch the sun a little closer and focus it on the bachelors dragging the cannons. We could incinerate it. Choke the troops with smoke, make them flee. And how am I supposed to make the sun come closer? I can't grab it with my bare hands. And it's winter, it's far away. Use the bells of Notre Dame as tongs. Gently pincer the sun and move it closer. You can use my lucky stained glass window. I'll keep it on a rope round my neck down my tunic. Or as a lens to focus the rays. I'll calculate how tall you need to be. The angle of refraction. Uh, let N be and carry O. You need to be... 72,000 and three-quarter toys tall. The angle of refraction is, uh, 97 degrees. Off you go, lad. So Gargantua swells up like a good one. It takes effort. It takes meddlers. It takes concentration. Oh, hello. That's unusual. A visitor. Hey. Ah, bonjour, Madame Soleil. I need you to come a bit closer to Earth and shine through this stained glass window. Oh, it's winter. I'm on vacation. But I'm trying to end a war by peaceful means. How are you going to manage that? Diplomacy? No, diplomacy is for averting war. Once it's started, everyone's got their dander up, darling. We just want to immobilize the enemy's troops. Well, their weapons of mass dough, actually. <laughs> weapons of mass dough? And where are they? Uh, there. Can you see where they fasten cannons to proving dough? The dough rises and spreads, so the cannons are drawn closer and higher, and they're all aimed at my parents' castle. Oh, yes. Cunning. They declared war because of cakes. Hostilities are based on the patisserie and the boulangerie. <laughs> C'est incroyable, sweetie. Uh, yes, it is, yes. King Picrocol is a cakey pig on a permanent sugar jag. His brain must be jammed by now. Do you know, young noble giant, I will help. But I can't move because I'm still and your earth goes round me. <laughs> I don't think so. Oh, look, pincer me closer with your bells. Place that little window in front of my burning golden mass. I'll give it my best burn. Oh. Thank you. Thank you so much. You have uh, gently ended a war. You're very welcome, darling. See you in spring, when your earth has moved closer to me. What? No, forget it. What? Is it me? Or has it suddenly gone very off? Ah, little the dough is melting and smoldering. The cannons are molten and running. Well done, Gargantua. What, man? <laughs> While you're still a bit bigger than normal, there's something you can do to put the finishing touches to the piece you've wrought. And what's that, Monsieur Rabelais? Lay your tongue across them. It's long enough. Immobilize them. Then they'll really know it's all over. Ha <laughs> ha, good idea. <laughs> And so the war ends. King Picrocol's captured and taken to Grand Gousier and Gargamel's castle, still stuffing his face. Son! Father! Egg tart! Son! Mother! Marsh pain! The war is over. You and your companions and tutor have ended King Picrocol's cake-induced madness. Son, you have proved yourself a worthy prince and a true man. I cacked myself. You know, I thought you had.
You'll grow out of it. When the time comes, you will be a fine and just ruler. I demand death by you, Log. Ooh, you haven't met Friar Jean. He single-handedly... Lumpering mince pies! ...routed a whole battalion, as well as helping us take King Picrocol's castle. You must be rewarded, Friar Jean. Tell me how I can repay you. What would you like if you could have... Anything. A gingerbread bread and jam pigs. I am the cakey pig. I am the cakey pig. <laughs> I'd like to be provost of my own university. Lemon slices. I'd run it in a very special way. No fees, marriage and civil partnerships available to all students. There would be joy, even in the corridors. There would be doctorates in matrimony. King Picrocole can run the canteen. Puddings every day. Cakes at break time. <laughs> Do what thou wilt shall be the university's motto. I'll drink to that. Well, we, we all, all will. will. And I will have Ponocrates as my vice-chancellor and Gargantua as my first and finest student. A, A toast, toast to, to the, the perfect, perfect education. education. So raise a glass once more to the glorious giants and to the joys of the senses. Next week, I will tell you about Gargantua's son, Pantagruel, and his best friend, Panurge, and their quest to discover if marriage is the right thing for them. And are they right in thinking that if you fear being cuckolded, it is wise to make a pact with your best friend so that he will cuckold you and you will cuckold him? Oh, friendship, what a ship of fools it can be. So join me for a tale of strange voyages, oracles, windmills, thievery, and gluttony. Here's to your heart, your health, and your hearth, my very good friends. And in the intervening week, may love unite your merry loins. Mm. Gargantua was played by Robert Wilfort. Rabelais, David Troughton. Grongouzier, Eric Potts, and Gargamel, Melissa Jane Sinden. Holophanes and Friar Jean were played by Jonathan Keeble. Panocrates, Malcolm Rayburn, and Udamon and the Sun were played by Catherine Hunt. Gargantua and Pantagruel by Francois Rabelais was dramatized by Lavinia Murray and produced in Salford by Gary Brown. And the concluding episode of Gargantua and Pantagruel is on at the same time next week. After the news, you can hear Joe Brand's choice of funniest book in Open Book. Before that... Wanted. Retired Army Captain for Light Household Duties. Two weeks of stories over on BBC Radio 4 Extra. Must tolerate mild eccentricity... From the man who's seen it all. Knowledge of prehistoric monsters, a positive boon. He's back. Welcome to the nest, Captain Yates. It was the Doctor. Starring Tom Baker as the Time Lord with a problem to solve. This work you're doing here, it has got to stop. Doctor Who, The Hornet's Nest, starts tomorrow night at 6 and again at midnight over on BBC Radio 4 Extra. Santé, my dear friends, and welcome back to a place and time when people walk alongside giants. Gargantua and Pantagruel by Francois Rabelais, dramatized by Lavinia Murray, episode two. It is an age of surfeit, sensuousness and unrestraint. Flesh is flaunted, food fondled, and vice versa. Wines drunk to gain the light that brought the grapes to harvest. <laughs> it is also the golden age of ridiculous belief. My story is as rude and raucous as life itself. Last time I began with the birth of the giant Gargantua. Today we have the death of Gargantua's wife, Badebek, whilst giving birth to their only child, Pantagruel. I know what a cruel way to start a story, but I needed Badebek's womb to deliver our hero and her absence to make him uncertain about the value of marriage. So, birth and bereavement. That is why we are here in the Cathedral of Notre Dame, attending the funeral of Badebec and the baptism of Pantagruel. Witness the nave filled with mourners and the west font filled with celebrants. It is a time of drought, because the sun has tripped over a passing comet and stumbled a little closer to Earth. 
The sun hasn't yet realized its mistake, possibly because it was carried closer to the earth by Gargantua, using Notre Dame's own bells as tongs. Dead is the noble Badabek. Oh, my poor dear dead wife. Who had a visage like one of those houses that look like they have a face. She died in childbirth, but because of the severe drought and prior to delivering a son and being taken into the arms of the Lord, she produced from her fundament 40 salt merchants. Hail, Badabek! Oh, my dear deceased Badabek's considerable drought affected fecundity. With 40 jackasses whose panniers were laden with salt. Salt! The poor, dear, dehydrated uterus. And a number of Arabian camels carrying olives in brine. Oh, sweet camels, who owe their being to my defunct wife's still servant. Will somebody please round them up? They're dunging the aisle. Oh, whoa! Oh. <laughs> Look, I'd better show my face at my son's baptism. Carry on. I'll be back shortly. There he is. My darling son, oh wonder and joy! I was just saying, because of the uh, drought, there's very little water in the font. You're able to baptise him, though. There is water somewhere down there. Oh, yes. The worst case scenario, of course, is that <laughs> I'll have to uh, bless my cheeks and spit on your baby. <laughs> Which cheeks? Uh, face. Oh, good. <laughs> Whilst you find some holy water, I'll just uh, pop back to the wife's funeral. <laughs> Excuse me. Oh, dear Lord, my poor post-mortal wife. Let us remember, <laughs> Badabek. It is so very sad that motherhood killed her. I believe the phrase, she died of joy, is the official cause on her death certificate. My poor wife. Oh, my dear poor wife. Oh, dead of joy. Resting in the arms of our Saviour. The Lord giveth and the Lord subtracteth after the divisions of life and the multiplication of his grace and favours in the brackets of his care. He that slideth the point to make us whole numbers or render us as fractions. Excuse me, but I'd better. <laughs> oh, look at my son. Beautiful boy. Ah, godparents. Yes. Have you, um, renounced Satan and all of his work? What have you heard? Yeah, who's been saying stuff? Oh, sorry, sorry, I have to ask. And, um, what is the name of the child to be welcomed into the church? Pantagruel. Oh. Who is very hairy. I used to have a dog with a similar coat. Oh. He was very intelligent. As was Esau. There have been many hairy men in the Bible. My lovely child. Oh, I love him so. My childy lolly, fedly fondy, dandly chucky balaki. My pretty rogue. Oh, praise be to God for you. So spiteful, so lively, so smiling, so pleasant and so gentle. <laughs> How glad am I! <laughs> Anybody found a drop of holy water? No. no. Uh, now, excuse me again. I must get back to my wife's funeral. is grass. Ah, oh, poor grass, all gone, 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 gone. Yeah, the burial service also mentions ash, ash and dust, ashes to dust to... All climactic eventualities are covered in the service for the burial of the dead. Drizzle to drizzle, snow to fog to... <laughs> We've almost forgotten what moist weather was like. We? <laughs> poor foggy wife. <laughs> I'm just going outside. I'll be in the porch. If anyone wants me, I'm a bit overwhelmed. I need to ask for Excuse me. <laughs> the drought is so severe that fishes abandoned by their element wander around into the villages and towns and cities crying pitifully, climbing in pint pots, snuffling about in the dew, looking for water wherever it lies hidden. My lovely... Gone forever, Baddy Becker. <laughs> oh, no. A reaper. We will Oh, hello, uh, fish. What's happening here, then? My wife's funeral is up the top end of the cathedral, my son's baptism down near the door. 
I'm just having a break from two contrary emotions. Yes, I'm sure I will be. <laughs> Tears of joy from this eye. Tears of woe from the other. What has what a sight to a fish such as myself? Me and my family will live on your face till the rains come back. Yeah, if you like, go ahead. One, two, three. We'll try to be discreet and swim in the direction of your facial expressions. It's very decent of you. Two years have passed. The infant Pantagruel is adventurous and strong and as tall as an elephant. His father, Gargantua, has chained Pantagruel's cradle to the floor out of tenderness and love. And then he strapped Pantagruel into the cradle to ensure the child cannot fall out and injure himself in a world filled with objects hostile to the young and inquisitive. The halberds, the long swords, the broad swords, the maces, the gizam, the holy water sprinklers, the pole axes, javelins, arrows and pikes, all scattered at infant height throughout his castle home. Oh, how unusual! A giant tortoise! Is it yours, Gargantua? That's no tortoise, sir. That is my son with his cradle on his back. I'm at my wit's end how to restrain him and keep him safe. Come on now, lad. Be good for Daddy, eh? Perhaps we should wedge him in the doorway for now. Good idea. Then he can still see us, but not come to grief. Right, uh, you take that side. I'll come round here. Uh, our little man, let's... Uh, uh, Fish face. Fishes on Daddy's face. Thank you, Pantacruel. Daddy does have fishes on his face. Oh, <laughs> I have noticed before for years. There's a whole shoal. Is that a family tradition, then, or family sport, face fishing? No, the poor souls were desperate to find water. Sorry, sorry I'm late, Gargantua, everyone. Oh, what an amazing tortoise. It's, it's not, not a, a tortoise, tortoise. it's, it's my son. son. Well, guess what? It's raining. I'd forgotten what rain was like. Thought I was the target of someone with a fat bladder and a perfect aim. Till I noticed the clouds. Yeah, clouds. Oh, rain. Rain, everybody. Ah, sweet fish. Shall we carry you back to your natural element? Where shall I put you? Pond, river, sea? Do you have a moat? Let us put on the type of boot, and it does exist, that allows us to stride over time. And here we are, 15 years later. Gargantua, acutely aware of the dangers of poor education because of his own eccentric and deficient schooling, is just waving Pantagruel off to university. And where else would his father Gargantua send him but to the Abbey of Telem, run by his dear friend, Friar Jean. Welcome, Pantagruel, to the Abbey of Telem where you will receive the best education, both emotional and intellectual, in the whole wide world. Thank you, Friar Jean. All you need to do is read until your eyes hurt. Then we'll give you a degree. Oh. <laughs> if only it was that easy. You can take semesters in dating, courtship and marriage with mandatory prenuptial arrangements. You may even major in marriage, if you like. The Viva Voce incorporates the marriage service and you'll leave here with a degree and a spouse, if you wish. So, you won't be a Bachelor of Arts, but a Husband of Arts. Right. S sorry, sorry, all this snogging is a bit distracting. Yeah, yeah, well, you'll soon get used to it. <laughs> you may even find yourself doing it. <laughs> now, here's your timetable. Your first seminar is courtly love, and it's about to start. Our tutorials will be informal in manner and formal in content. What are the benefits of marriage? Is it better to be wed than single? And if so, why? <laughs> Sorry? Marriage is a protracted fight executed in extreme slow motion. Sorry, it's... The blows are administered gently, with persistence, and passed off as caresses. A kiss is a bite. A shot without artillery. The head is a cannonball. The hands are maces swung at the torso like so, like so. Then you get cuckolded. Right. Uh, what about remaining single? Uh, pros and contras. Yes, please. 
It's mostly drifting dalliances, drib drab dundering, dystopic delving, moil in the mire, bint in the buyer, nighttime sordid and solitary. So, in conclusion, marriage is messy but blessed, bleary, cheery, and must with the proviso that you'll be right for cuckoldry. And bachelorhood? Dim, dour, sour, lucky, lonely, lascivious, and lecherous, but also calm. Unnagged, ignoble, and agreeable. Oh. <laughs> but hey, what do I know? I'm a friar. I'm him. <laughs> After three years of intense courtship, diligent dalliances, dabbling, dibbling, kissing of hands, wrists, flowers, and hems, dancing and composing songs and poems to the object of love. Pantagruel prepares to take his final examination before he bids farewell to his alma mater. Friar Jean, it's coming up to my viva voce and I have decided to take the bachelor option. Despite spending three years among wonderful young women and men, I feel disinclined to marry and uncertain of remaining a bachelor. Of course, my dear Pantagruel. You may resume your studies at any time and take a fully credited PhD in wedlock. <laughs> now, once you've done your viva voce, you must visit the famous Library of Limitations and Conventions in Paris. And don't be put off by the demeanour of the chief librarian. He has books that can answer any question. So, here we have a hero whose young man's fancy has turned to procrastination and whose schooling has made him three deliberations short of a decision, despite a three years' proximity to frisky young men and women. Will a visit to a library enlighten him? Hello? Hello? Quiet! Shh! I am the librarian. Would you care to join my library? I, uh, perhaps. Perhaps? Fine word. Second cousin to perchance, purchase, and auntie to purloin. Right. Is this a specialist library or general? Pretty general. For a specialist library. Can I borrow books if I join? And, sir, why would you want to borrow books? Borrow is father to burrow. I want to read them. I want my mind to swim with the minds of authors. To, to, to what purpose? So I will gain the knowledge they contain. Friar Jean recommended that I came here to help me discover the answer to a question. Friar Jean? Abbey of Telem? Says... Yeah! 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 At the end of every sentence... Yes. Mm, borrowed a book five years ago. Killed a man with it. Fetched it back. Blooded, but unread. That sounds like him. But I don't see any books. I don't keep them here. Why? Because their pages fade and I want to know. Where does it go? The darkness out of the ink. Must go somewhere. Ooh, spooky. Do you at least have a catalogue? Of sorts. Could I see it? Only if you're a mind reader. It's memorised. Right, right. Can I hear it? Only if I speak it. Ooh, give me <clears throat> a <clears throat> The puffin of magnanimity. The prisoner's cheese. Chopsticks versus sporks. History of hooting. Let's all look at some abbots. The fat man faffing in a fountain. What a lot of little fingers. Ooh, I do like Wednesday's curly bits. Second edition. Ah! Oh! 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 Hey! Excuse me for bleeding willy-nilly. Try to staunch yours. I am impaled. It is a maple. Oh, long story. Who did this to you? I didn't quite get their names. I was screaming at the time. Oh. Holy first edition. I'll tell you what, though. They were a pretty hostile bunch. Oh. This is a man of great nobility and lineage. Look how handsome he is. What terrible wounds. Luckily, his face has only minor bruising. Oh, his binding is split. Spine is cracked. 
His pages are heavily annotated and his cover is foxed. But his quality speaks some volumes. I will follow my father's excellent advice and invite him home when he's gained consciousness. And your father's advice was? To be kind to my fellow humans. What about my books? What about them? I will give you one to read. You can read it every time your new friend passes out. Here you go. Everyone's a monkey. It's written by the woman who guards the oracle of the holy bockle. The seer herself. The seer of the holy bockle? Oh, she's a marvel. A very wise seer. She's like... She's like a singer whose voice extends to five octaves. But with the seer of the holy bockle, it's time. She spans five centuries. She straddles time. She straddles time? One foot in the past, one foot in the future, and her fundament in the present. She will tell you the answer to any pressing question. And she is particularly adept at predicting the frequency, longevity, issue, and success of marriage. Really? The seer of the holy bockle is a marriage expert? The best in all the world. And where does the seer of the holy bockle live? Oh, oh sorry. Sorry, I must have... Oh, I was out cold, wasn't I? It's the bleeding and the pain... And the terrible, terrible memories. You were saying about the seer of the Holy Bockle. You know where she is? I will draw you a map. Uh, please, sir, you are bleeding so profusely and uh, I have no ink. Can I possibly... Use me as an inkwell, sir? Of course. Uh, turn left when you reach these islands. Beware the rubber sea and the gulls with false wings. And the sirens who snigger. And the men with little fish tails instead of members. Oops, I'm scabbing over. <laughs> That's all right, sir. My map is finished. Oh. Be warned, the map is one ninny 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 vic to three thousand leagues. The way to the seer of the holy buckle is very dangerous. The voyage will demand fortitude, rectitude, longitude, and mm, attitude. Ah, that was a great meal of wobbly, delicious tripe. You great big generous giant. <laughs> Pantagruel. Weird names we've got. Parents, eh? So, yes, Panesh, what happened? Who rammed a maypole down your spine, and why? I was captured by bandits. They had me on a spit with numerous other people over a fire. Round and round we went. I think the others thought they were on a sightseeing tour. Round and round and round, and the flames crackled, and we all began to sweat and cook. This is the end, I said to myself, but you know what? I decided to escape instead. It felt more like a whim than a bid for survival. Odd, that. So, anyway, I unscrewed my spit using my toenail. Then I passed myself off as a maypole dancer, skewered along the spine, certainly, but that was no impediment. I was top attraction on countless village greens and rural furs. They virtually paid for my trip home. I was good. I am good. Watch me, Maple. Now, this movement's called Green Man Fooling Around the Fur Below. Hop. You've been maypole dancing on the streets of Paris. Just how much have you earned? I mean, you kept disappearing onto the common. A lot. But, you know, the whole experience feels empty. I'm spending my time with people who mean nothing to me. Present company accepted. I feel hollow. 
But I have to earn money because I cannot presume to depend on your kindness indefinitely. Oh, I'm glad to share with you. It's really no problem. Just the opposite, in fact. Besides, I'm 35 years old and lonely as hell. Lonely? Ah, uh, your kindness doesn't do anything for my self-esteem. Different if you were a woman, I could uh, thank you in, uh, you know, in kind. I'm 35 prime now, but my sights will have to be lowered if I leave it any later. Look, I'm on a quest to find out if I should marry. You seem to be as undecided as I am. Why don't we both look into what marriage entails, and if we decide it's not for us, we shall have an enduring friendship, companions in bachelorhood until death. I, I studied wedlock to degree level, but I still don't know if I'm husband material. But, but do you remember... I have a map, drawn in your blood, that will take us to the seer of the Holy Bockle. She can look into the future and tell us if marriage is to be our fortune or our downfall. Yes, yes, let's consult her. But I'll still need money. Let's do something more creative. What makes money? I have a plan. <coughs> So, which part of a saint are we looking for? Doesn't matter. As long as it has a mouldy smell, we'll work with what we find. Uh, what about this? Ah, bit of skull. Nice, almost symmetrical. It'll do very well. Now, we need some nice cloth to lay it on. Any good at art? A bit. Well, knock up a painting, something blue and gold, with martyrdom on it, and we'll say that that's our saint. People pay to kiss pictures. Total experience. Look in the box, kiss the picture, make a wish, pray a prayer, and who knows? It might happen. Word of mouth, more people want to go. More people, more prayers, more chance of at least one of them coming to pass. Yeah! Miracles start happening. Ah, hey! We can take the relic out among the people. We call at inns and taverns. We knock on doors. How? Oh. So what are we calling our little miracle worker then? I'd like to call her after my mum. Badebeck. St. Badebeck. Ha. Huh. Pantagruel, I bring you St. Badebeck. A day later, carrying the relic and a painting of a martyrdom, they are off down the street in search of the credulous. While I'm flush, let's go and find this seer of the holy buckle. Uh, before we do, I mean, it's a long way to travel for advice. I think we should visit a professional debater. We may get answers closer to home. You think so? We can ask them to debate marriage versus bachelorhood. We're better to have the facts expounded, measured against each other and propounded than for us to just rush off on a journey we may not survive. And on the strength of their argument and the power of their advocacy, we will act. Bachelors for life, or pilgrims venturing to the seer of the Holy Buckle's Isle. My good, dear listeners, of course we all know that when we have a decision to make, we seek out only those people who are certain to tell us what we have already decided. We never genuinely seek advice independent of our own biases. That is what we now expect Pantagruel and Panurge to do. But no, I am the storyteller. I have decided that for once, an opinion is sought from someone whose perspective differs and whose opinion is yet to be drawn. Oh, Mr. Panurge and Pantagruel, my three o'clockers. <sighs> um, let me just check which debaters are on duty today. Victor Todger? No, no, you don't want him. Oh, he's got one track mind. Jasper Hawes Burp? Oh, no, hang on, he's off. His mum fell over a leper, came home with one leg too many. <laughs> Oh. Oh, dear. Monsieur Pantagruel, your debater today will be... Oh, this, this really is most unfortunate. Jacqueline Le Tuer Géant. That's an unusual surname. It is. I'll just, um... Jacqueline, love, you got some clients. Oh, thanks. Oh, sacre bleu. On your best behaviour, love. All the, uh, problems you had, they're in the past. Don't blot your copybook, eh? Yeah, Maurice, yeah. No probs, mate. Hang on. Her surname means giant killer. It's illegal now, isn't it? No! Oh, 
<laughs> really? You live in a city and you think illegal means it doesn't happen? <laughs> but but it, it's not going to happen. Jacqueline is a reformed giant. Yeah, thanks, king. Morris. We've paid. We may as well stay. Are we happy to proceed then, gentlemen? I'd be happier if you took the arrow out of your bow. And lost the bow. Right, gentlemen. Any other matters before we enter the debate? Well, it affects your professionalism. I mean, we want a proper debate. That's what we're paying for. He, 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 how is she going to... How are you going to... Oh, oh you'll to... see. Ta-da! When I gave up my... Uh... Selective homicidal tendencies? Hmm. I took up an apprenticeship with a gesticulator. Apropos, my strong arms are now used to speak. I wave, I arch my fingers, I curve them and make some lie down in my palm as I crook my elbow. These hands are loaded slingshots and are aimed for the vulnerable temples of an oversized human. I was married to the flatulent muck face! <sighs> now, uh, wave about with supreme eloquence. You got a problem with that? No, no. And I gesticulate back. Unless you want to hear rhetoric and not debate an issue. What you wish to debate, Morris didn't say. Marriage. Marriage. We want to know if we should marry. <laughs> Marriage! The oversized lump of snot used to leave his toenails in the butter. His toenails were like blasted gibbous moons. Right. Let's waste no more time and set forth our arguments. You are both debating with me. Yes. yes. Gentlemen, please prepare to gesticulate with clarity. <clears throat> if I cannot understand the sign, I will make this movement with my fingers. Oh. oh. It means something different to gesticulating debases. Thanks, Saint Badabek, for that. Uh, what? Uh, the moon. You're, 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 you're squeezing the moon? No, not the moon. It's, it's a type of beer and begins with T. No, no, not T. G, not beer. Uh, well, uh, I've got it, I've got it. A man walks into a tavern uh -huh. and... That is not a man. Is it a bride? Yes. Right, go on. No, no, no idea. Uh, a ship, maybe? Uh, I got it. A codpiece. Codpiece? That was a codpiece? No, a shoe. A shoe with a buckle, a beret, heretic, a breviary, a monk. Monk picking his nose and blessing the bogey. Is that against marriage or for it? <sighs> and there you have it, says. You were a worthy debater, madam. A worthy limb orator. Thank you. And I'm sorry your marriage didn't work out. Oh, you are, are you, giant? You mountain of khaki! She's found a bow! Run! I'm gonna get Did you get anything out of that? Uh, may maybe, possibly. I'm not sure. No. You seem to be gesticulating back. <laughs> you look like a windmill. <laughs> oh. Recognize the rider? You! Pentagrill? Yes? An urgent message from your father! Is he all right? Don't interrupt, it's bloody rude! So, it... Shut up! Enemies have attacked your father's land and he's retaliated with jesters! Jesters? Just shut your faces! Please, return immediately and help him quell this attack in a peaceful manner. The jesters won't be able to hold him off for long. A few bells and a pig's bladder on a stick are of no avail against an axe! Cat got your tongue? Sorry, I oh, wasn't sure you'd finished. I'm on my way. Right, you are. Oh, serious. And our island adventure's on hold for the time being. Yes, until I've helped Dad. Oh, do you know? Bravery suits you, my fine and noble giant friend. Come on, climb onto my shoulders. I'll run us there. Uh, out here. Uh, uh, ready? I've made reins out of your hair. Nice hair you've got. Thank you. Hold on! Yeah.
Yes, Pantagruel is being summoned to help oust an invading army by peaceful means, just like his father before him. Peace is a soft-shelled egg laid by the hen of history on the rudimentary nest of the present moment. Catastrophe is in its very construction. Its collapse has the inevitability of the laws of physics. Oh, oh, oh. Enemy camp up ahead. We may be able to take them by surprise. My good friend and fellow marriage marketeer, we are um, unarmed. You won't need weapons. Look at the size of me. Oh. Shh, shh. Just let's listen. Good night, Pravi Budgeras. Yeah, good night, Corporal Triple Nipple. Sweet dreams. Uh, Corporal, you, you don't think the, uh, the the enemy will attack us whilst we're in our pyjamas? Of course not. How can you be so sure? Because it's night time and they'll have their PJs on as well. So it's not going to happen. No regiment's mounted a full-out attack whilst in their nightwear. Wouldn't look good in the regimental history. Think of the pictures hanging in the mess room commemorating the attack. Think of how it would be remembered by the troubadours. Ho, 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 ho. Men who fight in PJs with their willies and their plums dance through their flies like tongues across the gums and the peek motion as they grapple and they lunge is hysterically funny in the rise and in the plunge. Ah, ha, 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 la, la. La 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 la, and the cord is weak and waistband pops, and down to the shin the loose brick drops, and the field is filled with mehen bending over, like thousands of moons with no cloud cover. Ah 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 
trumpety trumpeter popping along the parapet, as my dad used to say. Yes. Better out than in. <laughs> Can you hear? Yeah, yeah voices. Uh, yes. Oh, sh 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 they're, they're down here somewhere. Anything, Pantagruel? Uh, no, no. You? Uh, not yet. Oh, something's moving over, over here. Hello, who are you? A Panurge. And who might you be? I am... We are the people of the colon. The colony! Yes, the colony, not the colon. But what we are, we don't know. Are we, in fact, people? Did, did you did you come out in my farts just now? Oh, that is our method of transportation to the new colony, sir. But how we existed prior to our expulsion, well, I cannot tell you. Good gracious, you giants never fail to surprise. Not that I know any other giant pantagruel, but wow! People created by your farts. Amazing. Oh, uh, listen, let me ask you. Are any of you married? Well, it, it's when you um, it's when you find someone you like and you agree to live with them all your lives and you have a family, maybe, and that's about it, really. Doesn't sound too promising, does it? It can make you both parties happy, evidently. Marriage. It sounds like a sort of plaintive cry. Uh, marriage. I quite like the sound of it, Miss Elf. Are you two married? No, no. no. I, I tell you what, why don't all of you get married and go and live on one of these islands? Yeah. Yeah. Is, that, is that map drawn in blood? Uh, yes, my blood. Highly illegible, isn't it? That's a tad creepy. Well, the man who drew it had no ink. And I happen to be bleeding. Oh, there's lucky. Uh, yes. Uh, oh, this, this island looks ideal. You'll be happy there and live well. <laughs> I rather like being a creator. I mean, they're really quite something, these tiny fart people, aren't they? By the look of them, they're natural sailors and boat builders. Uh, how can you tell that? They're swagger. It's like they're used to walking on something that sways a bun. Well, they've been gestating in my guts. Yeah, but just watch this. Here are mushroom caps for you to rig. Oh, thank you. Oh. Yeah, yes, no instruction, but they know they know what to do. I will piss a river. Yeah, he will too. It's uh it's an inherited trait. Ah, which will flow into the sea. All aboard, we're ready to depart. A fair wind and a ready time. Home voyage! Goodbye! Bye! Still undecided about marriage, our hero and his friends seek a ship to take them to the island home of the Seer of the Holy Bockle. They ignored a hermit who wandered across their path as they made for the port. He may have been able to offer guidance since he had turned hermit in order to avoid his wife. His wife, too, had become a hermit to avoid her husband, but was unaware of her husband's predilection for the same lifestyle. Their paths cross more frequently than chance would dictate, and they have moved into adjacent caves. During the long, star-filled nights, one hermit thinks fondly of the other, and they each dream of making their way to the other's lady straw and bracken bed. Which goes to show that it is the circumstances and habits of a marriage that dictate its endurance, grace, and longevity. You're moping, Panage. Why? I don't want to be a cuckold. Maybe I should marry at the same time as you. Double wedding, eh? Maybe if we cuckolded each other, that wouldn't be so bad. Suppose so. Isn't that a Quinn Quareem of our Nineveh over there? No, no, it's a dirty British flagship with a rum-soaked central sail. Is it? Ah. So, let's hire a ship and crew and set sail to find the seer of the Holy Bockle. I think we really do need to consult her so we can get on with our lives. We've put our lives on hold. We have. Look at that man there. He's got a mast sticking out of him. Aye, landlubber fashion be twanky as a tumbler full of toes. Hey, uh, hey you. Uh, you. You with a fully rigged three-mast ship. Wait a minute. Ha, 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 ha,
According to the librarian's map, look, it's the island of Madamothy, famously covered in lighthouses. Oh, that explains the... Make for shore, please! Oi. All the dwellings there are lighthouses. The shops and farms are lighthouses, the pubs, libraries and police stations are lighthouses. Do you know, I think of you as my beacon. I mean, you rescued me, turned my life around and... Sorry! So what was that? I, I couldn't hear you for the pigeon post from my father. Um, oh, uh, nothing. A letter from home, eh? Lovely. Father's anxious to know how things are going. Oh, uh, how do you know? There's no actual note. There's a ribbon around his leg, see? Red for inquiry. I'll untie it and send back a white ribbon, signifying we're all well. Uh, and I shall also send this tartan ribbon, signifying our degrees, latitude and longitude. Uh, this is the Murray tartan. It, Indicates that we're in the Indian Ocean, close to the western tip of the subcontinent. Each tartan indicates a different geographical location. All at sea. Paisley describes land locations. Well, I had no idea. I just thought tartans were... Well, no, tartans, Paisley. Oh, there's a whole language to common patterns. Polka dots and gingham are the most complex and have to be plotted with a protractor and earwigs. There's another island coming up port side. I... I can't see. No, I can't either. Ah, 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 ah. Are you been wondering about yonder island? Aye. Tis the land of pettifogging. Tis the island itself that is blurry. Why? The people there work as... Well, they are paid to be beaten up, thrashed, pounded, mugged, thugged and slapped. And you're supposed to eat them as though you're doing it in jest. Like at weddings and family socials. Tis their trade being thrashed. Tis their gross national product. Hi! Punch me, I'm the bridegroom. Shouldn't you just be celebrating your wedding day with your new bride? That'll be my daughter. She's the bride. Give us a slap, sir. Special offer, two slaps, three headbutts, and a knee to the groin for a pony. You'll not get a better deal anywhere on the island, guarantee. I'm the bride! I'm the bride! See, you can't help me, but... Here's a barrel. Drop me in and kick it down the hill. Oh, what a perfect start to my married life, that'll be. Is this a normal start to married life? Yep. Are you happy? Oh, yes, sir, we are. We never fall out. If either of us gets peeved, we know a third party will come along and hammer our spouse. <laughs> Domestic violence as such is, as a consequence, unknown. Thank you. Panish, this style of marriage doesn't work for me. Let's try the next island. Where are we again? Bohu. Uh, or it might be Tohu. This uh, gentleman is the sole resident. How come? He ate everyone else. <laughs> I am Wide Nostrils. Hello, Hello Wide, wide nostrils. nostrils. He's only got little narrow nostrils. Oh, he's maybe aspiring to widen them. He must realise they're a bit pinched when he tries to pick his nose. Well, we all have blind spots about ourselves. Uh, Uh-oh, I think he's about to speak uh, again. I eat pans and kitchen utensils made of iron. Why? Because they're crunchy. What is your normal diet? Wide nostrils? The clue is in my name, you dunce ballock. Wide nostril. Well, witness. Windows? Wide ostriches. Wide bottom trousers? Wine? Wire brushes? Broadstairs? Yeah, but broadstairs. Running with the idea of wide, broad nostrils. They're like the top of the stairs for breath to climb down. Tenuous, very tenuous. <laughs> He's on a short fuse, isn't he? Do you think he was ever married? To be honest, I'm not going to ask. As soon as he's come away from the cave entrance, I think we should all run for it. Windmills! Windmills! Oh, eat a windmill! I haven't seen any windmills! I've eaten them! I've eaten everyone! Excuse me, sir, but are you married? Yes! Oh, that's interesting. I never have thought... Uh, and your wife... She was married to me. Master of logic, eh? And what happened? She was a windmill and I ate her. 
you married a windmill. You remind me of her. Careful, Pantagroom, when you argue, you wave your arms about like a windmill I noticed during our debate. I remind you of your wife, how? You look as though it's your fate to be eaten by me. How can someone look as though they're going to be eaten? Your arms! You're flailing your arms! Because you look like a windmill and I eat a windmill! Quick, run! <laughs> In extremis, we will speak our hearts. In extremis, we will bear our souls. So I'm placing Panurge and Pantagruel in extremis for their own good and for the conclusion of my tale. Make your peace with God! Pray! Snivel! Pray! Snivel a bit more! Think of your loved ones! Pantagruel! I have to tell you something! I... Speak up! Everything's very loud! Now it looks like... Now it looks like the end! Now we're about to go before our God! I have to tell you... I love... Do you know... I, I mean, stupid! I, what am I thinking? You're the last of my life! I'm a giant! I don't see that as an impediment, to be honest. I'm a giant! I can wade ashore carrying this ship! You're not listening, are you? Occasionally, the characters one creates display a sudden flash of self-will and extricate themselves prematurely from a situation. Bravo, my boy. Bravo. Uh, there's a certain professional embarrassment to having your ship picked up and carried out of a storm by a fair-paying giant. Not seemly. Dent in my pride. Don't feel the same about myself. Where's the dignity in evading fate and a watery death, eh? Oh, shut your face. Your beard's full of jellyfish. You've a limpet on your eyelids. You're a mess. Oh, we should have all drowned and be done with it. What's wrong with you? Well, it's the island we were looking for. It's where the seer of the Holy Bockle lives. Well signposted, too. Oh, I think I've cricked my back. <coughs> so, do we go and consult the seer of the Holy Bockle? I mean, she's only a bit further down the beach. In fact, you can see her cave from here. I suppose we should make the effort. We want to know about marriage. We'll visit her, do what she suggests. I can't quite believe we're here. <laughs> we'll soon know, one way or the other. Now I'm here, I'm not sure I want to know. Does that sound perverse? Not really. The adventure has been quite something. And we might not like what she says. Big King. Hello! Anyone at home? It's your fart, children. Why are you here at the Oracle? We help the seer. Her grotto's open all year round. Works regular so we can afford to raise families, can't we? So you've all remained married? Yes, in a way. <laughs> we're so small and new to the world, we have trouble remembering who we're wed to. Don't be careful. No memory for faces. A lack of facial recognition seems to be endemic. We therefore decided to be married to whom? So, that's like all of you are cuckolds, but happy about it. It's her. It's the seer. She sees it. She knows it. It shows. Every prophecy has veracity. She has natural sagacity. She's the seer of the holy buckle. She looks into the bottle and she sees it'll cost you, but you won't mind. Hello, I am the seer. This is the holy buckle. How can I help you? We want to know about marriage. We, Panaj and myself, uh -huh. wish to know if we should marry or not. Just a moment. 
I'll look into the holy buckle. Oh, what can I see? The age-old sediment never lies, but it can be a mare to interpret. You can really see something in all that guff. Guff? Guff? This sediment provenance is such that it could not be doubted, even in a court of law. This bottle contains the last fluid ounces of the wine our dear Lord created from the water at the marriage in Canaan. This wine is consecrated by the good Lord for the joyful celebration of marriage. It is the still fermenting fruity with a touch of almond heart of blessed and holy matrimony. It is the blood on the marriage sheet. Well, one metaphor too far for me, lady. Ah, interesting. Yes, boys. The old holy bockle has an answer for you. It does? Please, face each other. I will place the holy bockle on the floor between you and allow the energy of the most distant object in the universe dictate its movement. What is the most distant object in the universe? No idea, but there is bound to be one, isn't there? Now, please, concentrate on the holy buckle and open your hearts to its message. <laughs> oh, wishful thinking. It's pointing at me. Just a mo. I'll give it another. Oh, interesting. Obvious. Uh, curious. Definite. Incontrovertible. Unambiguous. Inevitable. W what does it say? Well, I think you already know. I think you're a fraud. I think you'll find I'm not. Why is the bottle twitching like a compass on a rusty sword? It's pointing at me, then it's pointing at you, Panage, because... Because it's saying we should get married. To each other. We travelled all around the world to find each other. I've hung ribbons and flowers from my maple in honour of my beloved. I'll be there to turn you over and over and over every night. Oh, my dearest love. <laughs> Let's get you with. Let's get you joined in more or less matrimony, although some will complain that it's inappropriate because you both have... Uh, Priapic capabilities, but let's get you hitched. Because all are equal. All are level. It's love. And it knows no bounds, and it rings like a bell, and it rounds like a buttock. <laughs> I now declare you husband and husband. I give thanks for my wonderful sons. Thanks, thanks Dad. Dad. <laughs> All marriages hope for issue. Heirs and heiresses to the traits, foibles and fortunes of their parents. For Pantagruel and Panurge, there are the beloved fart children, those already delivered into the world, and let no one say they are bastards, and the happy thousands yet to be trumped into existence. To those whom marriage blesses, it does so with abundance and tenderness. However... Marriage does not always accommodate the quirks and disquisitions of the human heart, but rather magnifies its weaknesses. We are human, we are foolish, we are willful, and we are alone in our multitude traveling, sometimes with giant steps, towards the great perhaps. If love is yours to know, then live it. To you, to yours, to all you strive to become, I salute you. Bon santé. Gargantua was played by Robert Wilfort, Pantagruel, Justin Edwards, Rabelais, David Troughton, and Panurge, Conrad Nelson. Holophanes and Friar Jean were played by Jonathan Keeble. Jacqueline and Sia, Fiona Clark, 
and Wide Nostrils and the Secretary were played by Mark Chatterton. Original music was composed and performed by Conrad Nelson. Gargantua and Pantagruel by Francois Rabelais was dramatised by Lavinia Murray and produced in Salford by Gary Brown.